Hi, everybody. It's Bean, and welcome to an all-new episode of Great Moments in Weed History. This week, we have a very timely and very historic great moment to celebrate. Of course, I am talking about the 10th anniversary of the vote to legalize adult use, a.k.a. recreational cannabis that happened November 6th. 2012 in Colorado and Washington State. This truly changed the game for everyone everywhere who loves weed, and we have just seen a wave of legalization happening since, not just in multiple U.S. states, but around the world, and I couldn't be more thrilled to have as our guest for this episode to recall all the highlights along the way, Wanda James. Now, Wanda is not just a cannabis proponent, not just somebody who was at the forefront of this campaign to pass the law, but she is also a cannabis entrepreneur, including as the first black dispensary owner in the state of Colorado. We're going to hear her incredible story. Quick Programming note, Abdullah is still on. Say it with me. Hiatus, as he works on a big project, but he is going to be back soon and definitely sends his best wishes to all of you and, of course, to Wanda herself, who we met when we filmed an episode of the Vice series Bong Appetit with Wanda and her husband, Scott, in Denver, Colorado. So, Wanda, I noticed you have a really cool little pot pin. Um, I take it you guys are cannabis enthusiasts? We are most definitely cannabis enthusiasts, cannabis entrepreneurs, and cannabis professionals. We have been doing this now since 2009, when we were the first African Americans licensed in the state of Colorado to own a dispensary and a manufacturer of infused products. Sadly, as of today, 2015, we are still the only African Americans licensed in Colorado to own a dispensary. But also, you know, an interesting part of us getting into business is, is what we're doing here, is the food aspect of it. I've worked with people suffering, people with cancer, MS, etc. Simply curing cannabis has really given us an opportunity to not just educate, but to help a lot of people. And we truly believe in that. I would love to take you down and show you our new dispensary, Simply Pure, which is just a block away. Then we'll go check out one of our grow facilities. And then this evening, my cannabis chef husband is going to treat us all to an amazing cannabis-infused meal. So Very cool. So we've got a packed weedful day. A weedful us, day. Yeah. <laughs> The reason I say this episode is not just historic, but very timely, is because we are, of course, talking about a law that was passed by the voters, both in Colorado and in Washington state, and in almost all the states to follow. Legalization has happened because the question has been put directly before the voters, and we have come out to support cannabis to support ending these arrests and to support legalization. And here we are 10 years later in 2022. And in less than a week, it's going to be election day. Early voting, of course, is already happening. And I'm really excited to say that in this election cycle, we have five additional states that are voting on legalization. If you live in any of these states, if you have friends and family in these states, please, please, please contact them and make sure they know, one, that cannabis is on the ballot, and two, that they need to vote to end weed arrests and end this terrible, racist, oppressive prohibition system. And I'm looking at you, cannabis people in Arkansas, Maryland, Missouri, North Dakota, and South Dakota. I also have to give a very uh, specific message to our friends in Minnesota. There are going to be on your ballot in Minnesota candidates from two different legalization political parties. One has the word cannabis in the name. One has the word marijuana in the name. Without getting into the whole story, these are unfortunately spoiler candidates. I wrote an entire article about this on Leafly. You can get more information there, but please, if you know people in Minnesota, make sure they understand what's going on there. 
Final 2022 shout outs, John Fetterman in Pennsylvania and Beto O'Rourke in Texas, whatever your politics may be on other issues. Both of these candidates have been long time and consistent supporters of legalization, and we need to vote for candidates who support our issue. And you might be saying to yourself, well, there's a lot more important things in the world than weed when it comes to electing our leaders and Maybe that's true, but I would say then even more so, um, if you don't want this to be the last election we ever have in the United States, please participate in it, add your vote, and do what's right. And if your feeling is, oh, voting doesn't ever change anything, it doesn't matter, I just hope this episode about grassroots activists putting measures on the ballot people coming out to vote for them, and that creating legalization will change your mind. You know, there's a saying in politics, if you're not at the table, then you're on the table. I guess the weed equivalent would be uh, if you're not rolling up, you're getting rolled up. So please smoke the vote with us this year. Support legalization, support candidates that support legalization, and just generally, uh, let's not have a bunch of fascists running the country if we can easily avoid it. Now, before we get on to this incredible decade in the making story, as always, we want to say a huge, huge thank you to our supporters on Patreon. You are keeping the thousand watt grow lights on here at GMIWH headquarters. You are inspiring us to continue with this podcast. And if you would like to join us and put five on it, or even as little as a dollar, you can go to greatmomentsinweedhistory.com. That's where you will get the video version of this podcast. You see me waving at you right now at a slightly higher level of support, you can get a signed copy of my book, How to Smoke Pot, properly sent to you in the mail. And every other week, when we are laying fallow on this podcast feed, you will get a fresh new podcast through Patreon. So we are still a Weedly podcast every Weedness Day. But if you want to get them all, You've got to join us at Great Moments in Weed History. Dot com. I want to say thank you to all the Patreon supporters specifically who have been uh, sending me encouragement about the secret sessions that we've been doing. I've been reading some work in progress excerpts from a new book that I'm working on, getting feedback from our community, answering questions of listeners, and really enjoying sort of that intimate connection. And then every other weed, we're right back here on the podcast feed doing our big, great moments in weed history stories like two weeks ago when we had race car driver and weed smuggler extraordinaire Randy Lanier, and this week when we are going to talk to Wanda James. A little background on Wanda. She grew up a Navy brat. She then served herself as a naval officer, and she now advocates for veterans with PTSD to have access to cannabis. Wanda is married to a former Marine named Scott, also a friend of the podcast, with whom she has owned and operated five award-winning restaurants. We actually got to visit one of those in the Bong Appetit video that Abdullah and I filmed with them. Incredible food, great vibe, and walking distance from their dispensary. So that is what they call synergy. After managing two congressional campaigns, including for Jared Polis, who is now the uh, governor of the state of Colorado, Wanda actually worked on uh, former President Barack Obama's National Finance Committee, all of this leading up to 2009, when Wanda and Scott opened their first dispensary, which was then called the Apothecary of Colorado, and that made them the first black licensees in the United States to own a dispensary, to own a grow operation, and also an edibles company. As we'll hear in this interview, Wanda also played a very integral role in the campaign to pass Amendment 64, which was Colorado's groundbreaking adult use, aka recreational cannabis law. This is a great moment in weed history that we've all lived 
through. Some of you may have been a little too young to appreciate it at the time. So this 10th anniversary is an incredibly important time to stop, reflect, Wanda and I talk about all of the benefits of legalization and, of course, some of the disappointments in how the legal industry has been rolled out. But more than all that, it was a great chance for Wanda and I to celebrate how much progress this community that she and I and Abdullah all love have made. And, of course, a couple of years after this historic vote, the three of us We're all there in Colorado for the first day of legal cannabis sales. This is a great moment that deserves to be celebrated in high style. There's your pun for this weed. And to do that, I've got a nice little J ready to spark up. If you, dear listener, are as excited as we are about 10 years of legal weed, but you're not rolled up, no worries. People fought for almost a century for this. We'll wait a little longer. All you have to do is hit pause and use that time to roll a joint or to split a blunt, to pack a bong, to endabulate a dab, or do whatever it is that you need to do to get where you want to be. Because when you are ready, we will undoubtedly be ready. For another great moment in weed history. Wanda James, we are thrilled and honored to have you here with us. Welcome to Great Moments in Weed History. Yay, Great Moments in Weed History. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I know enough about your cannabis journey to know that you've experienced a multitude of great moments in weed history, some personal, some professional, and uh, of course, the big one we're going to talk about today being the 10th anniversary of Colorado and Washington voting to legalize adult use cannabis, but we like to start right at the beginning. Can you tell us when cannabis first came into your life? You can tell us the version you'd like to say into a microphone as well. No, you you know what? I'm not, I am, here's the beautiful thing about cannabis, right, is uh, there really aren't any embarrassing stories until we get to the edibles portion. <laughs> you know, that first year of edibles was was maybe the only time where it got, you know, anything embarrassing. And then that was usually, you know, I, I couldn't move for 12 hours or something like that, right? It's not the same as alcohol stories, right? And then when did you know cannabis was going to be an important part of your life? I didn't, not until 2009, coming off of uh, Barack Obama's National Finance Committee. And Scott and I were talking one day on our balcony and we became fed up about what was happening in America, mass incarceration, social justice. So we sat down with uh, Brian Vicente and Mason Tavert and said that we wanted to open up a dispensary and you know, what were going to be the steps with that? That became the spark that lit Amendment 64, us getting into the dispensary business and continuing this fight for social justice. You know, in, in many ways, the political and the personal uh, intersect in all of us. What experiences from your own life drew you to see cannabis as a political issue, one that you wanted to get involved with and one that can really make important changes in society? Yeah, my brother was a slave for 10 years. <laughs> That's the most disgusting thing that can happen to a black person. And to have my brother be a slave in in this system for 10 years was quite frankly more than I could fathom when I heard his story and what he went through and not seeing an attorney and all of the ways that America screwed him over. It was imperative to me and to Scott that we jumped in and put a black face on this, made a difference. And we haven't stopped talking about social justice, mass incarceration and the bullshit that happens in in the legal system now for, for years. And sadly, this has also led into, as we'll talk about more, is in the ridiculous over whiteness of this industry 
um, and the over white maleness in this industry and the pushing out of people of color whose backs this was built on. And can you can you talk just a little bit more about um, your brother's case and what happened just to give our listeners that that sure. context? Sure. My younger brother was arrested when he, uh, uh, I believe he was actually arrested when he was 17, went to jail when he was 18 for four ounces of weed. Uh, he and four of his friends were going out one night, went and got the, you know, four ounce baggie, remember baggies, $40. So for about $160 worth of street weed, my brother lost 10 years of his life. He wasn't incarcerated for the full 10 years, but that began his 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 circle into in and out of prison, in and out of prison, in and out of prison. Because once you take an 18 year old and slap him with a felony, and then I found out that my brother did do four years picking cotton in a Texas um, penitentiary, you know, for this crime of $160 worth of street weed. So I became disgusted, pissed off, beyond pissed off. I became ridiculously angry. And this was an opportunity to do something productive with that anger and maybe help spark an industry. But I have to say, though, back in 2009, we were not thinking about sparking an industry. (laughs) Who knew? Back then, we just wanted to stop mass incarceration and police brutality. We opened up our first dispensary in uh, mid-2009. I wasn't fearful of going to jail. I'll be honest with you. If they were going to arrest me, they were going to have to come with a hell of a fucking charge, right? Because I just got off of the president's campaign, just got off of the congressman's campaign. I'm a former naval officer. I'm a graduate of the University of Colorado. So if they were going to try to make me a criminal, they were going to have to work real hard at it. And so because of that, I felt really safe in speaking out about cannabis, the cannabis industry, mass incarceration. My husband, who was a chef, talked about, you know, cooking for people with medical issues. Our restaurant did cooking classes for for medical marijuana patients. So we dove all the way into this industry and wanted to make this normal because in our life, cannabis has always been normal. So we wanted to take away that stigma of doing something in the back alleys, you know, behind the trash can kind of a thing and shine light on it and show people that no, great people get elevated. Doctors get elevated. Elected officials get elevated. Presidents get elevated. So that was a a big thing for us was normalizing this plan. And just to give people perspective, this was a time when several states in in various different ways had approved medical cannabis laws, but we were also still seeing raids of those state legal medical cannabis businesses and dispensaries and grows by the federal government. So this was a very early era in in that process, one where the threats that you're describing are very real. They're not theoretical. They're they're happening. And you, in your own words, are saying you were willing to be a test case if if need be. What was the earliest point where you got involved in the campaign that ultimately led to adult use being approved by the voters of Colorado? That happened immediately. Brian Vicente, Mason Tavert, Christian Cedarberg, at the time, Jared, Congressman Jared Polis, all very tight, close circle of friends. So there was this very tight relationship of folks that understood politics and understood what we were trying to get done. And I'll be honest, we knew that it was going to pass in Colorado because cannabis, Colorado has always been cannabis friendly. It's um, been a place where rich white people come to smoke weed. And in knowing that doctors and lawyers and elected officials and, and politicians and professors all smoked cannabis and preferred it in Colorado, we knew it was going to pass. Peter Lewis from Progressive Auto Insurance was one of the folks, early people who funded the campaign for us to be able to make it happen. And then Brian Vicente, Christian Cedarberg, Mason Tavert, Lisa Kaufman, you know, all did their thing. And, and, and here we are, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so many years later. You know, I, I hear what you're saying about feeling confident that it was going to pass or in your words, knowing it was going to pass, but it was certainly unprecedented at the time. It was crazy. We had three former governors, two mayors come out against us. They did TV ads talking about how bad it was going to be. The perception of Colorado was going to be destroyed. People won't send their kids here to school. Conventions won't come to Denver. All these horrible things were going to happen. People were going to be stoned in the street. Children were going to be stoned. The world was going to be stoned. 
sky was going to fall. It, yeah, it was going to be horrible. I mean, and there was a lot of ads about it. Um, a lot of politicians had called me and told me that I had destroyed my career. People weren't going to want to talk to me anymore. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And we actually got raided as well, too. The Adams County Sheriff's Department raided our facility. We had to call in big guns to back them down um, because people were actually legitimately going to jail for all of this stuff. Did that, did that raid take place during the campaign? How, how, how uh, far away from the vote was that? And do you think it was meant to uh, intimidate you on a political level? We were actually doing an interview with uh, the Westward at the time, and my phone kept ringing, kept ringing, kept ringing. So I finally picked it up. I was like, I don't know what's going on. And it was uh, a gentleman's voice on the other side. This is, man, this is Adams County Sheriff, whoever it was. We need to tell you what we just did. We just raided your facility, and we need you to come down here. <laughs> I says, you know, it's a legal facility, right? And he's like, we need you to come down here. And that's all they kept saying to me. So we had like an office in front. It was in an office park, an office in front. Then you walk through the office into the grow facility. On the door of the office, there was a huge sign, 11 by 17 sign. This is, this is a legal, legally licensed Colorado grow facility, license number with mine and Scott's cell phone number on the sign, on the door. They would have saw it the minute that they broke through this huge window. They confiscated all of our patient books and, and different things. And, you know, we had to get on the phone. I had to call every political person that I knew from senators all the way through the Congress people. And I was like, you guys need to fix this and fix this now. We are the only black people licensed in Colorado. This is total bullshit. They know clearly who we are and we will sue the fuck out of them if they don't fix this very quickly. In about 20 minutes, they called us back, apologized, brought everything back to us, boarded up our our window that they broke. And the next day they came and had a long conversation with us and said that they didn't even understand what the legal they were clueless about everything. But yeah, it was complete intimidation and it was ridiculous and I don't play intimidation. Yeah, the the way that you definitely react when you don't understand the law is by smashing into somebody's place of business. That's right. definitely... Right, and instead of just... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and a quick Google search would have told you exactly what you were doing, you know, so... And we weren't shy about it right during that time. So there was lots of interviews and, you know, lots of press. So yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 in so many ways, you were uh, a, a spokesperson for this effort to legalize cannabis. And I'm wondering what the emotional landscape was for you leading up to the vote and, and that night, where were you and, and, and how did it all unfold? So we were all together at um, Castleman's. I remember that we gathered there and there must have been, I'm so bad with crowd sizes. I'm like Donald Trump. It was the biggest crowd ever. Um, <laughs> this huge crowd of people there was press from all over the world um there i mean and people were sticking microphones in your mouth and we're from luxembourg what do you think about this you know um so there was so much press going on and i remember i don't know if you've been a part of a an election night but they're you know showing different races throughout the night and they're putting up joe blow one as governor or whatever it is all of a sudden, I heard this scream, and I turned around, and up on the big screen, it was Amendment 64 passes. And the whole place just went berserk. History in the making. Again, this amendment legalizing marijuana, making it legal for adults 21 and older to possess and use up to an ounce of marijuana, also allowing in 2014, January of 14... They just heard. They just heard. Numbers saying that Amendment 64 is a go. History in the making here, folks. Colorado, the first state to pass this, an amendment to the state constitution making marijuana legal here. And again, the question is, okay, so even if the state passes this, what happens at the federal level? Campaign directors here telling me that they don't think the federal government's going to stop them, but we're going to have to wait and see. Non-stop party. Now, the one thing I was told... Everybody just started grabbing everybody and, and crying and, and hugging, and I was there with all of the people that we had been fighting with, the, the patients that were there, and um, the original hippies that had pulled this together in Colorado, the attorneys that had worked so hard on it, the people that were involved in medical marijuana. It was really 
um, man, it was a thing, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> it was fabulous. But, you know, but, but looking, but looking back on that now, the thing that amazes me the most is that I'm still surprised that we have not federally legalized yet 10 years into this. And granted, all these states have passed. We've done so many great things. But the fact that the politicians on the federal level have shown such cowardice to move this forward is concerning to me where we are today. Absolutely. Well, I do want to be the one to say that that was certainly a great moment in weed history. And I, I just want to make the point, as you, you referred to the foreign press being there that night, this event had reverberations far beyond Colorado and Washington state, which also uh, voters passed a version of legalization the same night. This not only began the the momentum for legalization we see in the United States, but really changed the conversation around cannabis all over the world. That conversation continues today. Of course, we have a lot of progress to make, not just in places that still need to legalize, but in places that have legalized. And just real quick, on that on that night too, so cannabis got more votes than Barack Obama and Governor Hickenlooper. So, <laughs> and we use that politically every time a politician has something to say, it's like cannabis got more, got three times more votes than you did, so. <laughs> yeah, that for anybody <laughs> not steeped in, in politics, that is the equivalent of scoreboard. <laughs> scoreboard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And and really, you know, to your to your point, should have been the key data point that at least for the Democrats made them see yes. the power in this issue politically and to 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 still 100%. be where we are 10 years later is uh I, I think in both of our opinions political malpractice uh <laughs> with with really really serious consequences for people's uh, day-to-day lives. Um, I think the other thing w- that gets lost sometimes in looking back on this period, just as when you entered the medical cannabis industry and, and movement, there were still raids taking place by the federal government. And even at the local level, you were fucked with in the way that they fucked with you. Prior to this vote, uh, then President Obama had not really taken a position on whether or not his administration was going to allow this law to be implemented. So what do you remember of sort of that uh, time period and then ultimately Obama, uh, you know, coming out to address this issue? You know, it's so funny. And it depends on where you are, you know, in your Obama-ness as to whether he did enough, didn't do enough or, or could have done a lot more. And obviously we were all hopeful that he was going to do a lot more. I think he felt like he started the spark which he did with the Ogden memo, which allowed for states to, to, to do their thing. And I think that he felt like that was his responsibility, right? I sparked it, y'all run with it, make it happen, move it forward. I don't think on his watch he wanted to be the black guy that legalized cannabis. Um, I would love to be the black person that legalized cannabis, but we all have to remember, <laughs> we all have to remember you know, people are going to look at their legacies differently as they go through this process, right? He absolutely could have done a whole lot more, but I am thankful that he at least started that spark that got us here a decade later. For more on uh, former President Obama and cannabis, please go into the Great Moments in Weed History archives for our episode about the Choom Gang. Yep, the Choom Gang. His early weed smoking crew back when he was Barry from Hawaii. Uh, Mm -hmm. Ultimately, he did allow, obviously, legalization adult use to be implemented in Colorado. And that did set the precedent for many, many states to follow. So it took about two years to actually implement these laws and for the first adult use sales to take place, which was another huge uh, media and global event. What What are your memories from that day? That was awesome. A very good friend of mine, Tony Fox, she did the very first legal sale to a vet uh, who was a medical marijuana patient. So they made the first legal exchange. And once again, another huge media moment, right? And I remember because every once again, we were all there. And so there was like all of this press people and they were all like on ladders and stuff trying to get the picture down of them like actually exchanging money and getting the receipt you know and doing that kind of a thing it's funny because i guess i have like you know these really warm beautiful memories of that time you know what i mean it was 
we really did something. You know, I mean, we just sold a Schedule One federally illegal drug that was Nixon's hench plant for, you know, hippies and black people, right? And here we were having a woman-owned business serving a United States veteran cannabis with cash and a receipt with press, world press everywhere. Man, that felt like something, you know, that felt like, (laughs) that felt like something. Absolutely. Another great moment in weed history. Uh, (laughs) And now let's, let's, you you need need like a, you need like a big, like, you know, great moments in weed history. (laughs) Oh, we got one. That's the, this is the (laughs) post-production. Let's, let's talk about what's been not so great. Uh, in terms of uh, not the theoretical legalization, but the way that it has been implemented and regulated and, and how that affects you personally as a, as a business owner and a cannabis consumer and also the community. We had all these beautiful moments in weed history and we all thought that this was going to be, you know, the changing of, of where we were going to be with everything. And sadly, in weird ways, and I guess it's the pendulum and how it swings, right? Americans, big country. We like reignited the reefer madness BS that was kind of going on to the point to where Colorado and John Hickenlooper were absolutely no friends to the industry. Let me say something just real quick too. In in the 10 year uh, anniversary dinner that we just had, John Hickenlooper and Mayor Hancock both turned around and looked at me and Brian and said that we were right and they were wrong. Um, It was a phenomenal moment of once again, coming together and another great moment in weed history that those naysayers admitted publicly in front of people that they were wrong. Hickenlooper, of course, was the governor of Colorado at the time of the vote. He uh, told people to vote against it, even though he himself uh, became prominent as a brew pub owner, so a producer and distributor of alcohol. Hmm. In one of the states that has one of the largest issues with drunkenness and death and uh, drunk driving accidents, but mm, sidebar. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But 10 years later, they're on the right side of things. So yay to them. But they were no friends to this industry. So my brother early on was my grower through the medical marijuana years. I had to fire my brother when all of the rules came into place because if you had a drug felon, you could not be in the industry. So you had to work your way through that. Um, regulators that were hired, it was the first time, and I've been an entrepreneur forever. My husband and I have owned restaurants for 25 years. This is the first time that we'd work with a group of quote unquote regulators that hated the people they were regulating. So they came in, you know, all military and everything else. And I mean, just ridiculous in the rules and the regulations that they were putting through still are quite frankly here in Colorado. Um, moving cannabis in Colorado is more difficult than moving nuclear waste through Colorado. Makes no sense. And then the federal government coming in with the 280 tax penalties, you know, which wipes out all of your profits from a business and you have no write-offs, no depreciation, no banking, (laughs) no loans, no lines of credits, none of that. Right. So it has been a ridiculously difficult business to be in. And if we weren't so passionate about the plant and the good things that we do for society, it would make zero sense to remain in this industry. Yeah, we have a we have a saying on this podcast, you can't trust the same authorities that unjustly prohibited cannabis to justly regulate it. And I think there's almost no greater example of that than the experience of of your brother and the continued punitive nature of the authorities to say the people most severely impacted by these laws that we're now supposedly admitting were unjust, people who became felons because of cannabis are going to be specifically already facing obstacles created by this prohibition severe ones, are going to be specifically excluded. I mean, nothing could say more about the mindset of those implementing these laws. And when we look at all the hurdles that you described, including things like banking, the more hurdles, the harder it is for people with less capital 
to survive and compete. Those same hurdles that might be easily surmounted by somebody with a uh, eight-digit market cap are going to be insurmountable to people who are what we might call mom and pops or small businesses or however you want to describe it. And going back to the time Colorado was implementing these laws, the feeling was very much for political expediency that I think is very understandable. How do we make sure this law passes? And some of that are these clear compromises with people. Compromises with the federal law enforcement people is, is what you're talking about. Just so you're, you're, that's who we had to compromise with to be able to move forward. Yeah. Yes. But I do think, and I, I want to know your, your thoughts, that since then there has been a movement to recognize that it's not just if we can legalize cannabis, but how, and an, and an increased understanding of the need for uh, social justice aspects to these laws. The issue that we're running into now is we are trying to figure out social justice after we opened up the barn door and let all the horses out. So Colorado, new governor, Governor Jared Polis, who was my congressman that we, we got through, and, and Jared is doing phenomenal things for the cannabis space here in Colorado. But once again, we are a mature market. So now after all of the dispensaries have been divided up, after 3,000 grow facilities are here and all the processing is happening and all the new candies are out in the market and everybody is test market in Colorado, now we're saying, oh, maybe we should carve something out so that people of color have the chance to own a business. Well, there's nowhere to put a dispensary. 262 dispensaries in Denver, a thousand feet apart. There's no more spaces, except for that one space down behind the track that no one would ever find. So yeah, it's hugely difficult now to reinvent this industry after we've created these multi-million dollar barriers, maybe billion dollar barriers in some places. And these big companies aren't just buying a dispensary, they're buying 48 dispensaries in Colorado. <laughs> How do you compete with that, right? And a lot of the rich white guys like to point to Simply Pure and say, well, look at you, you're doing it, you're successful. We're successful for one reason. We occupy a very unique space in this industry, being the first, being a little bit famous about it, and having done it for 13 years, right? So that's not something that is transferable to any other person right? Or any other company. So no, we can't look at simply pure success and say, well, if you can do it, other people can do it. It's a very different scenario. To share your experience with people in other states that might be in the process of legalizing or that might be looking forward to legalization, what would you recommend people do to make sure not just that these laws pass, but that they're implemented in more equitable ways? So first and foremost, there's a couple of things that need to have happen. One, we just need to legalize. We are twisting ourselves into knots to do everything that legalization would do. We need somebody to help train us. Great. SBA. We need somebody to give new loans to new businesses. Great. SBA. <laughs> we need a whole, you know, industry that could do supplier and supplier diversity. Great. SBA or the federal supplier diversity program. We have so much in America to make small business work. Just friggin' legalize. I'm a free market person, I'm not a capitalist, but I do believe in small business. And small business will work if we just get out of the way of it, right? And that's 98% of the issues that we've got going on. Short of that, what needs to have happen is states need to allow the same type of licensing that happens at airports, right? Fine. You're a great big MSO. You want to get this license? Fine. You can get this license. But 40% of your supplier diversity is going to be minority companies. Because the idea that we're going to start all of a sudden funding and bringing in all of these minority uh, dispensary owners, minority cultivators, minority products. Yes, there's going to be some. But this game is so big now, you know, and you know this. It's you can't just come out with a gummy anymore. You have to have a whole entire company behind your gummy, a marketing plan, salespeople, fast acting this, fast acting that. It's no longer just let me get $100,000 and open up this great company like it was back in 2009. It's I need $48 million. So 
let's make those licenses in new states tied to what they do for supplier diversity, just like they do at an airport. That to me brings people of color in, means that all of your janitorial services, your paper delivery, all of those things are all minority um, operators and minority companies that might not be plant touching. So we develop more people of color in the industry in that way. Well, I want to I want to leave things on a on a very high note. You know, we've had multiple great moments in weed history throughout this episode and for our listeners uh from all over the world really who might find themselves in Colorado and have an opportunity to visit you at Simply Pure, uh w- what's it like to to walk through the door of of Simply Pure 10 years after this vote and and what would you see and smell and experience. Through all of this, I maintain so much joy when people talk to me about Simply Pure. It really is, uh, I know this sounds cliche, but it's my happy place in the world. It's everybody's happy place. You know, I was there yesterday and a couple walked out and I was like, hey guys, thanks for coming in. They're like, you're the owner. And I was like, yeah. So we started talking outside. They were from Ohio. They're like, we had medical marijuana, but we've never been to a place like this. And it was so warm and it was wonderful. And your staff was amazing. And, And that's what we want to feel. And when you come in the door, it's simply pure. You're going to feel like you're doing nothing wrong. There is, we don't have armed guards in there. There's not a great big green pot leaf on there. As a matter of fact, there's a a beautiful plant structure with our logo, with all of the Colorado fauna that make up our logo. Um, When you go in, our budologists, they're not even bud tenders, they're budologists because they spend so much time studying products and the plants and what it does. And we literally spend 20 minutes with a lot of our customers. And, you know, I hear some of the bigger stores saying, oh, God, we get people in there and we get them out, get them in, get them out. You know, that's not our philosophy. We're there as long as you need us to be there. You want us to explain the effects of a gummy to you? We're going to explain the effects of the gummy. We're going to explain how the drink works. We're going to explain how the suppositories work. We're going to explain how the bath oils work. We're going to go through all of your entire day, how you can wake up with cannabis, have some CBD to help you get through your day, and then end with some indica. We're going to, and not even indica, let's take that away too. We're going to talk to you about terpenes and how those are going to affect your life, you know? So we're going to change your whole perspective and what you thought you were walking into when you went in to go buy a joint because we're going to change it into an entire experience of enlightening you on cannabis and our world. So... That's what we do. Fantastic. Well, I got to say, you know, we've had uh, some fantastic, great moments in weed history together. The three of us with uh, Abdullah did the Bong Appetit episode. You can check that out on YouTube. And of course, I greatly look forward to the next opportunity for us to blaze one together. Wanda, thank you so much for this interview and more so for everything you've done uh, to bring cannabis freedom into the world. Yeah, highly elevated and extremely (laughs) happy. So what what can I say? We live in the dream. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) 